Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this panel entitled Playing for the Public, the ins and outs of producing actual play podcasts and streams. I'm joined by a bunch of lovely people for our panelists. Um, I want to thank them for their time and coming to talk to uh, the Tabletop Gaming Club here at the Savannah College of Art and Design. So big shout out to you all. Thank you for donating your time. And I am very excited for you to lay upon me your vast knowledge. Um, I'd love to introduce you all to the people who are here and to everyone who's watching this after the fact. Um, if we could go through this list, if you could introduce yourself, your name, your pronouns, and tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with uh, producing wonderful shows. Uh, Summer, can we get started with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Summer. I use she, her pronouns. You can find me on Twitter at Just a Summer Job. Um, I have been in the tabletop community for the past four years, and I've spent literally all of that time producing tabletop content. I have a channel called Off the Table, that's off underscore the table on Twitch and Twitter, um, where we have been running games for almost the past four years. Uh, we really pride ourselves on running on running indie tabletop games, um, lots of Powered by the Apocalypse, um, lots of GMless games, um, and we have uh, new new seasons about every four months, and we always do about three to four, maybe even five new shows during that time. So we've been doing that for a hot second. Um, I am a writer for Urban Shadow Second Edition. Um, I'm a podcast editor, have produced podcasts like Of Black Glass, Isido Beach, Cape Lorelei, Missing Annie Lee, um, and yeah, so been doing this for a hot second and have dipped my toes into, I think, every bit of design work, content creation that you could possibly do for, for tabletop games. So I'm really excited uh, to talk about this because I wish that I had had something like this when I got started because <laughs> it was definitely a learning curve. Um, but yeah, after doing it for for this long, I feel I feel pretty good about it. Hell yeah. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Junie. Hi, everyone. I'm Junie. I use she, they pronouns. Um, whew. You can find me on the internet at Stellar Empress. I am also with Off the Table. I am one of their newest editions. I've only been working as a content creator for the past five months or so, but in that time, I have learned a lot about just the ins and outs, the background work of production from uh, casting to setting the the ground rules and getting safety tools in place and just making sure the not only the work environment but the atmosphere of that environment is conducive to like cooperation and just fun. I am starting to get my feet wet with producing my own podcasts as well as well as writing games but that's not really something I have enough skill to talk about yet at this point, but I am here to lend what expertise and what knowledge I have. Thank you. Gnome? Uh, hello, I'm Gnome, pronouns he, him, and I'm the director of communications for Die Hard Dice, as well as a podcaster, editor, photographer, marketer, social media communications, I don't know, communications, there's lots of hats when you do communications uh, and I've been in this industry for about four or five years and pretty consistently uh, making content as well um, more predominantly in the streaming space for TTRPGs uh, where I bounce around from different channels either as a GM or player um, but I also produce um, my own shows as well as do um, uh, other podcast productions and am the editor for the Stitch of Fate podcast which is a Vampire the Masquerade game. Ooh, that is a system I've been meaning to check out because I yeah. love me some vampires. <laughs> it's it's a world, that's for sure. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you, Kiana. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Kiana. My pronouns are she and they. Uh, I'm known as Kiana S online. 
I am the uh, co-producer for Salt Street Games uh, alongside Lauren Irwin. Uh, we do a lot of TTRPG stuff there, both on streams and also dipping our toes in with uh, podcasting, as we did with uh, Missing Annie Lee in collaboration with Off the Table. Um, I have been involved in uh, the streaming community for about the same amount of time, about four years. Uh, but uh, I spent the first couple of years uh, helping out other people's channels. Uh, so doing stuff like social media, uh, doing stuff like uh, cash especially for charity streams, uh, organization uh, behind the scenes in all different types of ways, uh, and also doing a, uh, a thesis actually on, on uh, TTRPG streaming and how it impacts uh, the narrative and games that are being played. Uh, and now, uh, over the past couple of years, I've been running uh, Salty Free Games, uh, but I've also been doing a lot of freelancing uh, in uh, writing games. Uh, and working with uh, with companies for uh, their adventures and and the such and and streaming their games as well. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically I do a lot of different things in the in the uh, universe. But in terms of uh, of this, I'm mostly uh, co-producing TTRPG streams and uh, and podcast now. Amazing. And last but not least, Leanne. There's the unmute button. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Leanne. Pronouns are she, her. And I am a co-producer and editor of the actual play podcast, Bad Heroes. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Leanne Shaw Rose. Uh, I'm also a speculative fiction editor for Corio Magazine. And I have been dipping my toes into freelancing uh, and writing for TTRPG games as well. Um, the bulk of the experience that I bring uh, to you today you know, to talk about is um, with Bad Heroes, we started this show about two years ago with absolutely no experience. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, so I can especially talk about the, those, that sort of like low level grind um, of being completely new to podcasting and wishing that there was somebody to tell us what to do. Um, and I can talk about you know, um, mistakes we've made, what we've learned from that, um, and, uh, you know, how to get better with every episode that you put out. Incredible. Again, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Nala. I'm going to be your moderator. I use they, them pronouns. And as far as like in this space, I, I appear on shows. <laughs> I have been on the cast side of things. Um, I've been wanting to get started with this kind of thing. So I thought this would be a perfect panel for me to moderate. Um, I'm very, very excited to be talking to you all today. Uh, and yeah, I would love to get started. Um, as you'll see here, I have a PowerPoint presentation and I will just be going through and labeling our topics as we go. Um, but the first thing I'd love to uh, get y'all's thoughts on is try, it's like, so I have a great idea for a show, right? I am a person who has an idea. Maybe I picked a system, what game I want to play, but I'm not sure like what I want to do with it. So I'd love to talk about um, podcasts versus streams. And I don't know where my font went. Give me a moment. But yes, I'd love to talk about like the difference between these two uh, platforms and which one you'd recommend for certain things, like what are the pros and cons of each of them? And uh, feel free to um, have a free for all here. I think that would be uh, good for discussion or whatnot. Um, but would someone like to start us off here? I can, or Kiana, if you wanna go, sorry. Uh, either way, <laughs> you can go ahead to go. <laughs> okay, um, so I, I, I do a lot of both and do whatever. <laughs> Honestly, it makes you feel the most comfortable. There's some people out there who do not want their face out on the internet, whereas other people are comfortable with that. Um, I personally find that podcasting is easier and less stressful compared to live broadcasting. Um, there's just a different level of stress um, when you have to run tech, you have to moderate the chat, you have to, you know, just uh, you, you can't really take a break so much um, uh, if you mess up on something or you don't say it the way that you wanted to, or you have to have a rules check. Um, there's just a lot of things that can interrupt streaming gameplay, whereas podcasting, it is very easy to just be like, hey, hang on a second. 
give yourself a little space in the audio and then go look up the rule or let somebody go take the break that they need to or maybe they can redo a scene that just didn't really hit as strongly as they had wanted to and they have a better way of doing it this time around and you could do that with podcasts instead of streaming yeah so um i guess i i want to take a couple of steps back here and also uh bring in some of my academic background into this uh and research so um a, a thing that we should probably put as ground rules here is, is that um no matter what, as soon as you bring your game into the public view, it's going to be very, very different than if you're doing a home game uh, because you are involving, one, the internet, and two, an audience. And those are going to have impacts on your stories uh, and your games and how you play with each other and uh, what you need to be thinking about in terms of, and we'll probably get into this later, about like finances or like how do we share stuff. Um, but in terms of talking about podcasts versus streams, um, what they do is they provide two very different types of mediums uh, for you to present your, your games through. Um, so live streams are, are great in the sense that, you know, you're able to come together uh, and play a game. And you're also able to now bounce off of the fact that there is an audience there live with you um, and interacting with you on some level, whether that's just them in chat and, and talking or lurking, or whether that's, you know, um, very specifically designing for, you know, having a donation incentives where they can impact elements of the story, uh, even if it's something like just adding an advantage that someone can use, or being as intrusive as, uh, hey, surprise, there's now a boss monster that I've, I've, I've donated to, to add in. Um, so there's a great amount of, uh, performativity and really interesting ways that we can that you can kind of uh, work with the fact that you are working with a live audience and you are doing it live uh, which is a very different energy um, and especially great for things like charity uh, incentives and the stuff like that because you're able to do it live and able to incorporate uh, that audience who is there and and encourage them to be involved uh, while you're in there and not quite in person, uh, but have that uh, personability there. Uh, podcasts, on the other hand, uh, have a very different, again, a very different way that they can facilitate different types of stories because you're able to take those moments and able to edit in stuff or uh, change which scenes happen when or add in sound effects and music. And um, it's like, oh, you know what? This would actually be great if we could clarify this. So let's add in, you know, an extra line or so here, uh, like we've been doing with uh, Missing Annie Lee. Um, and that provides a very different experience because you're not working with a live audience. You know it's going out to an audience, so you are going to change how you play because you know that it is, it is a product that's being put out. Uh, but you are now being able to have that, that story element control there. Uh, and you're able to even balance it out to maybe even removing some of like the actual play elements. Uh, so you're not like talking about what dice you're rolling uh, the same way that you might be with a, with a live stream with a such, um, or if you're playing a home game. Uh, so yeah, so they're, they're just very different mediums and they provide support for different kinds of products and storytelling that you want to be doing. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with, uh, you know, everything that, that they've said so far. I think because um, when, when you're like, when you've got an idea, say you've got this idea for a game and you're like, you know that you want to put it in front of the public somehow, right? Um, I think there are a lot of different ways that you can approach doing that. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of people are like, well, why don't I just do it myself? Um, but the reality is, is that there are a lot of great channels out there that provide the space for people to come in who have no tech production skills at all, who have never produced anything to come in and run a show in a public manner. I know, um, you know, off the table does this every season we have open casting calls for gms to come in they pitch their ideas to us and we select ones that we think are a good fit with the channel have like good vibes and if we really like the system um so not everything is like a, you just have to sit down and do it yourself if you want to do it yourself i think you need to think about how much time and effort and potentially you know funds that you want to put into producing tabletop content um 
the the barrier to entry for streaming and for podcasting are both incredibly different. There's a lot of different type of work. Um, I think that production for a tabletop like stream, um, there's a lot more upfront production, right? You need to um, obviously for the, for both figuring out what system you're going to use, what how you're going to do casting, um, if you want to compensate your casts, if you have the means to compensate your casts, um, and then um, you know deciding what day of the week you're going to play, how long you're going to play, um, getting, you know, session zero done, safety tools, setting up streams, like making sure that you have all of your production done. That's all done up front for podcasting. Um, you do a lot of that up front too, but you do, um, you do a ton of back end work, right? Um, so for the podcast that I've done, we try and do most, if not all of the recording, um, over a one to two month chunk. So we just play the whole game that could be, um, you know, for of black glass, that's 33 episodes of content at running about an hour each, um, which feels like a lot when you're releasing a podcast bi-weekly that's going to release for you know nearly a year and a half um but for for tabletop streams obviously you're like you're telling a much longer story over a period of time because if you run for you know 10 weeks or 20 weeks and you're doing three hour streams you can double the length of a podcast um but obviously there's like a lot of different there's editing that goes into a podcast. You're cutting out content where streaming, you're seeing it live. So I think it's really, it it depends on what kind of story you want to tell and how much work you want to like front load or back load into what you're producing. Um, and obviously they're very different experiences, you know, uh, like Gnome said, you know, some people just don't want to play live. There is this pressure when you're streaming to be on, um, not just like when, when you're playing a home game, people understand like if you need to take a call for a second step away you can put pause on the whole thing um but when you're streaming there is this pressure that even when you're not in a scene you need to be fully engaged right there's no like turning your brain off or going on autopilot when you're on stream because people can tell like if you've got you know rbf like i do people think that you're not having a good time if you're not actively engaged with like the content that's being produced right um and so there's some like that would be a con of like streaming, right? This dedicated time where you have to be um, it, and it's exhausting. I think people don't understand just like uh, there's definitely for me always like this, like I'm the moment a stream ends, I'm just like, I need to go lay down for 45 minutes. Like it's exhausting because you're just on the whole time. Um, and so a benefit to podcasting, obviously, like Noam was saying as well, is you can you can kind of uh, take a step back and, you know, Kiana, like you can rearrange scenes. We're doing that for Missing Annie Lee, where it's like we told a really good story. How do we make it even better? How do we take it to the next level? Um, and a lot of that can be done in editing where streams, you don't have that. So it's a pro and a con because you don't have to edit a stream. You can if you want to, obviously. Um, but you can you can just let it be as is. People understand you're playing live. People understand that there's going to be rule checks and breaks um, that you know you're going to have to step away. And then for podcasting, they're expecting a more like polished product. Um, so when people have ideas for a new show, there's so many questions that I like want to ask them before we even get started. Just like, well, what story do you want to tell? How long do you want it to be? Like, do you want to have that in? be engaged with a live audience? Do you want to have this finesse and polish? Like how much music production do you want to do? Um, and kind of get uh, a sense of like why they're, they're wanting to produce this as content and also like for who? And like, what do they want to get out of it at the end of the day? Because I think like when you have this big idea, you need to like realistically look at it and say, okay, well, why do I want to put this out there? And what story am I trying to tell? Is this more about me and my friends, like getting together and like being collaborative with, um, you know, an audience? Are we wanting to have that experience or do we want to like produce something, right? They're both production, but they're, in my opinion, they're totally different. So getting started with your idea, I think there's a lot of questions that you need to look at. And, you know, like I said, before all that, do you even need to do it yourself? Or are there places that you can do that and start to like get your feet wet without having to, um, you know, consume all of this information before you get started? You brought up a really interesting question about like, who are you doing this for? Mm -hmm. um, and I typed a question at the bottom here, but like, when is like, if, if someone or a group of you could address like, 
when is a group ready to go online? Like, I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, hype around shows and podcasts, especially that I've seen from recently joining the space. Um, I mean, Critical Role is like the big one that like pretty much so many people know about it and it's very, very popular. And I'm sure there's lots of people who see that and are like, oh, that's cool. I want to do that too. But obviously I don't think this is just as, as you were all saying, like this isn't something you can just like jump into. Like there's a lot of work. And I think there's a lot of things that people don't even consider before they're like, yeah, I want to do this. So like, what, what would you all say? Like what makes a, um, how do I phrase this? Like what, what makes a, uh, like, is there a bar for like a home game to become in the public space, I guess? Yeah, so um, one thing that a group could do, you know, uh, when they're thinking about whether or not um, they're ready to take their uh, take their stories to the public would be to, to do a practice run, like a dry run. Um, you know, if you're thinking about doing a stream, maybe that looks like just hopping on a group Zoom call and recording it. Uh, if you're thinking about doing a podcast, um, you know, uh, turn on a mic when you're doing your session and then, um, see how that feels because just the act of recording can change the energy and the dynamic of the table knowing that what you're doing is for consumption as opposed to just a home game for example um it also that also allows you to work out um you know any kind of like first time jitters or um technical hiccups and and speed bumps um it's uh so that's that's just one one thought I would add on top of that, um, on the less technical side, um, you you need to establish what the like what the tone and the goals of the story you're trying to tell are, and what the expectations are for the players. But like the degrees to which you do this and the points at which you do this vary between podcasts and streams. Like Summer mentioned with the previous prompts, um, for streams, a lot of the work is much more front heavy because once you're live, you're live. The impression you set with that story is more or less what people come to expect. So you need to be clear on what is and is not okay, what, what things you want on the table, what things you don't want at the table. This is where safety tools would come in, like lines and veils, especially XN and O cards like in the moment. But you, you want to have everyone be on the same page about what this story is going to be like in the midst of the telling. And uh, to, to get an idea of how structured it's going to be. Actual plays, in my experience, are a little more free form than like pre-written stories, but they can have that air in either format. Uh, but if you... If your goal is to tell a particular story in a particular way, you can't make that a surprise for anyone you're working with, if that makes sense. As long as you set that ahead of time, it should put you in a good place. Yeah, I, I feel like I say this all the time at every single uh, panel I do for this club, but communication is so, 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 so important. Please talk to everyone, um, your players. I, I feel like in home games and within like the tabletop gaming, like public, uh, like the general public of people who play specifically like D&D, I see this a lot in like the D&D community, but there's like this like, DM versus player dynamic and like, oh, the DM has all the secrets and all this stuff. But I feel like for these kinds of things, um, you should be more upfront with the kinds of things that you're going to include in your stories um, to avoid uh, springing things on people that they're maybe not ready for. And especially when things are gonna be played out in the public eye, especially the live streams, you can't really take anything back. And so it's really important to communicate these things for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, long story short, session zero is like a huge, a huge thing on everything that I do. 
um, because uh, when, especially if you're doing like an open call casting, the the odds that you get a group uh, together that they haven't, they either haven't played together, they don't even know each other. Sometimes they're meeting for the first time. Um, establishing kind of establishing tone, but also kind of feeling out group dynamic is a is a huge thing. Um, I think I. Basically, within the first, I would say, 15 minutes of a session zero can tell if a group is a good group, um, just based on how they communicate with one another, um, kind of matching energies. And I think as you do more and more production, you kind of get a sense for who those people are when you're looking at uh, if you're doing like open call applications. Right. Um, so setting expectations obviously when you're casting in the first place you don't want um you know you can say like oh it's going to be like a grim game um but you need to explain like fully i i think the a disservice to yourself would be trying to surprise your players with like the tone and like the full extent of what a game is going to get into because like saying like okay this is a dark game you know is is one thing but it's super vague like that could mean different things to different people um if you're having like a really really grim war story like um you know black glass was i felt like i was stating repeatedly uh, both in the application process um and then in our session zero and then at the beginning of every every recording session like okay here's where we're thinking about going like really setting expectations um something that i use and would recommend to other people is catsp which is C-A-T-S-P. Um, it's something that I send out for um, whenever I'm doing projects um, and it is uh, concept, aim, tone, subject matter, play. Um, and basically you cover what each of these is gonna look like in your game. So concept is like what your idea for the show is, right? Aim is why you're telling it. Tone, obviously the tone of the story. Subject matter gets into more in depth into like, uh, you know, what exactly you'll be covering and then play is a bit of like um what you expect expect play to look like um where you address the people like this is what i think is going to be happening um and i think that those can um can really clear the air on a lot of like confusion um and giving giving as much information to your players as you can especially if you're going to be the one running right um i think most people do who get into production are running their own things like at the beginning um running their own games so um if you're going to be the one running or if you're going to be running for other people or like running production for other people um making sure that you get as much information that people aren't surprised because that's the last thing that you want to happen um judy touched on safety tools um safety tools are super critical for um especially for public play knowing what is on and off the table um to bring up and um you know depending on the the theme of your game um you know talking about things like consent x and o cards lines and veils um and you know open door policy um all of these uh knowing and understanding all these tools and being comfortable using them um can make or break a group uh you know i've definitely seen groups fall apart because of a lack of safety tools i think we all have right um and so, yeah, I think having a clear understanding um, of your expectations um, and, uh, you know, expectations of the stream as well, uh, you know, when you're running production um, or you're producing streamed content and you do say you have a chat that can interact or impact the game, making sure that everyone at the table is cool with that and understanding like ultimately the people at the table have have ultimate say over what this looks like and making sure you're still promoting safety um at the at the end of the day so yeah i think just always communication um is is such a huge um is just so important when you're producing content but yeah basically having a really thorough session zero or a couple of parters of a session zero can really um make sure that your group is is you know ready ready to go when you hit record or you know launch that first episode for sure all really good points i would like to move on unless anyone has any like really big things to add on to this discussion but i'd like to move on to casting if possible um so with uh casting um so you've got this idea you figured out you're going to do a podcast you're going to do a stream um and if you don't have like a set group of people that you wanted to do this with, because sometimes sometimes you're just like a standalone GM and you're like, I have an idea and I need players. Um, how, how do you go about casting? Um, obviously, I've seen people like put 
casting calls out on social media. And um, if a person doesn't have um, a lot of like uh, social capital for lack of better term, like if someone doesn't have a lot of followers, um, it's gonna be harder, I think, for them to get their casting call out there. Um, but are there other ways to cast shows? Um, I know some are mentioned reaching out to channels that already exist because they can provide support in that sort of sense. And a lot of these channels come with a built community and you could probably find players that way. But um, yeah, uh, how, how do you go about casting your stuff? Y'all better jump in because I'll just talk nonstop. Yeah. So I don't want to keep going. <laughs> but your your casting methods are so good. Mine are a gamble. I've done, I, Tell us about the gamble. Tell us about the gamble. Okay, so I, I'm very much a, a gambler when it comes to casting calls for things that I do. Um, I I Because I'm usually part of whether I'm the GM or a player, most of the time I'm a GM. Um, I want to make sure that people are cool with my GM style, which is super no prep um, improv style um, that is based on everybody else. So if, 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 you know, there's people that are coming to the casting call expecting we're going to play, you know, Curse of Strahd and hit everything, like that's just not going to happen at my table. But I need to, as a producer, be very upfront about, what type of game I'm running. So usually I, in the casting call, I put out everything, um, all of my expectations as far as time commitment, um, when we'll be meeting, um, you know, I've already designated like the day and time because as the GM, it's gotta, it's gotta go around my schedule. Are you able to come and play at this time? Um, and what I really like to do though is elevate new voices in the community. I love finding people who are just passionate about playing, whether I've met them before or not, um, we'll learn about each other in our session zero. <laughs> and if that works, it works. If it doesn't work, then kind of go through the recasting process once again. Um, so that that's what I mean by like gamble. Uh, I often will play with people like I have a, a mix of folks who I personally know so I have at least one anchor at a table and then a bunch of other people who may not know each other but I definitely um, when I do my casting calls I'm very interested in like why do you want to do this do you understand that this is a an extensive time commitment um, for me um, my podcasts and stuff like that are paid opportunities. So I'm very upfront with like how the money is distributed. You know, this is what it is. This is what's expected because there is pay involved. And I, I, I don't know. I just kind of like mixing every, everything up a bit. And so far it's, well, but I got some wood. I've had really good success with it. I'm sure there's going to be a time where it's a big bomb, but we haven't hit that point yet. So, yeah. hey, luck's on your side, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that's kind of how I went about my own stuff, too. It's being like, well, I know the people that I would like to play with. I know the people that I know I can play with. And here's, you know, uh, so I guess like with casting, you got to go to you kind of have to go, OK, am I looking to pull on the people that I know and that I, I have some familiar familiarity with? Or am I going to go for, you know, trying to pull complete strangers or like people that I may have in my social circles that I've never played before or haven't talked to beyond just like Twitter exchanges? Um, so when I was doing casting for charity stuff, uh, it was that was mostly it was all just people. It was an open call. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get people in. I know I have these time slots and I'm just going to try to pull a group together, um, which was very stressful. It's a lot of work to cast because you're not only juggling, you know, schedules and scheduling interests, uh, but you also get, you're also developing a group that one is going to be able to play together well to be able to work and like, you know, collaborate uh, out in and out of the game, uh, which is not always possible. And it's not that because they're bad people. It's just, 
sometimes play styles don't match up or sometimes, uh, you know, personalities don't mix and that's fine. Uh, it happens. Um, so it's really, really important then to kind of go, okay, how are you finding the ways to make those connections and uh, make sure these are the right people that you're looking for. So beyond just asking for, you know, hey, do you have the right tech or do you have the right, you know, uh, time commitment or the stuff like that. Um, vetting is so, so important. Um, so uh, whether that's putting into your casting form, like, hey, uh, we use safety tools here. Um, we do not tolerate bigotry of any of like, and, and calling that out specifically. Um, and also I super recommend going onto the social media uh, and seeing what they're interacting with, what they're liking, what they're tweeting, uh, because you will find that there are a lot of things that they'll say on on their um, casting forms that you can't tell uh, unless you go looking what type of person they're going to be. Um, so vetting in that sense and then doing uh, and, and also being clear uh, with whoever you're casting um, that um, who's also being involved because some people like already know who they don't work with uh, or who they can't work with um, or who they don't want to. Um, and so not surprising your your people that you're you're hoping to get cast into something with their fellow collaborators it's really really important um so you know and that can be a complicated process if you're trying to get if you're just putting out feelers all at once uh but it is important as soon as you confirm somebody to go hey like to everybody else that you're still uh, checking out just be like hey so this is who's in so far uh, and giving them grace and, and room to bow out if it's not going to be if it's not going to be their scene uh, and that's totally fine it's, it's happened several times before with me and I'm like cool glad to know that we're not going to put the two of you near each other in any future uh, opportunities but we can play with each other in separate things and that's totally fine uh, so yeah and then a, a session zero like we've mentioned before and, and having that kind of test session and be able to play uh, do a dry run is really important because then you'll get to see what that chemistry is like with casting uh, and then go, okay, sometimes you may have to make the decision that someone's not going to fit in. Uh, and it's, it's tough, but if you, you need to have the right processes to, to kind of work through, okay, what happens if that's the case? Um, do we just take the whole project down or do we, do we talk with everybody or do we find, uh, like, do we have a process of, of uh, onboarding and uh, a new player in at this time, et cetera? All good points. Um, if anyone else has anything else to add, if not, I would like to move on. Casting, casting, casting. All right. We got a great group of people now. Thank you. Um, we have a great cast. Um, and I think like it was mentioned uh, before, um, a lot of casting forms are like a Google form that you fill out or you send mm -hmm. an application email in um, and then the person who's casting will go through it and uh, sort people and pick people that way. Um, that seems to be the, uh, the, the, the norm for that. Um, but I, as someone who's applied to a lot of casting things, I see a question on it a lot asking about equipment. And I'd like to talk about that really quickly. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time to delve into the super nitty gritty specifics about um, all sorts of equipment stuff, but in general, uh, for someone who's just starting out, like what would you recommend for equipment for either streaming or podcasting? Obviously for streaming, you're gonna want a camera, podcasting, that's not needed. But like in general, do you guys have any uh, recommendations for people who are looking to start out for the first time? Like, yeah. is, is there a bare minimum? I, I oh, that's a great question because I think for podcasting, there is kind of a bare minimum for microphone. Um, it doesn't have to be amazing, but you do want to make sure that you're not like screaming or peaking or like really like hurting people's ears. Um, so like generally headset mics probably won't cut it for a podcast. I will say though, however, I am all about being as cheap as humanly possible until you're sure this is something that you want to do more on a full-time basis. Like don't dunk money into a crazy expensive mic first thing first, only for you to find out that streaming and podcasting isn't for you. Like I'm sure you'll get use out of it. Right. Um, but I think most of us kind of started like with the, like the blue Yeti or like the snowball, right? Like, um, like I know I did, like I just started at the, the bare minimum mic and then slowly worked my way up. Right. Um, so just for me, it's like, get something that works. Don't kill yourself. Don't break the bank to like 
get this like high tech equipment because generally, especially streaming, I think is pretty forgiving um, as far as like what your equipment um, is, especially if you're using something like Zoom and you've got like auto gain or something going on. Um, generally audiences uh, for podcasting a little bit less so, which is why I say podcasting, you probably are going to want to look for like a little bit nicer quality microphone um, uh, or recording software. Right. Um, but for streaming, if you're just getting started, um, you know, I would highly recommend if you can, before you launch into producing your own stuff, join as a player, see if there's any open seats um, at, at other tables, just to kind of get a feel for it and be like, is this something I want to do? Um, but yeah, for, for me, for equipment, just like the bare minimum, you know, just enough so they can see your face and hear your voice um, before you decide to like buy a $200 microphone, right? Yeah. I, I know that for me, I started with a Samson Meteor microphone. It was like maybe four inches tall, very mm -hmm. portable. Um, it did the job <laughs> for sure. Um, and one year later, I upgraded to this. Um, I'm blanking on what it's called, Elgato Wave 3, I think. Um, and so this is like my upgrade, but like I definitely started from like the Samson Meteor, which I think is like a $50 microphone, which like $50 is like a decent amount of money, but it's way cheaper than like a $300 microphone or whatever. So <laughs> absolutely. And yeah. I've been streaming for four years. I'm still using the same, same Blue Yeti. This is the same mic. It, I, it's You're been amazing, through several Kiana. different cities with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I've only upgraded with, you know, having a, a, a mic arm with it. Uh, so it's it, I it's navigate it. I'm able to put it in different places and closer to my face now, um, and I have like a, a a pop filter here. But like, I'm doing professional streams with this, uh, and in terms of camera, I have a, a. Most people will recommend what I which I have, which is the Logitech uh, C920, uh, which is it's it's about as as if you're if you're going beyond your built-in webcam that's probably where you want to go it's uh they have built-in software to do uh control over your over your you know color balance and and exposure and makes it easy for green screens like i have here um so yeah so like there are good like begin if if you're going beyond what you just have built into your stuff or with a gaming headset or whatever else uh there are these options, but again, like, like Summer was saying, I totally uh, agree. Like just do what bare minimum you've got. Like I was on my built-in camera uh, for a good year or so. And then I, I finally got a, finally got a better camera and then finally got better lighting and just grew because I knew this was something I was investing in. And this was something that I was, I was interested in. Um, but yeah, I, I literally have the same mic that I've had for four years and it's done super well. It's done great. Uh, what's really helped was having, you know, again, free software uh, that, that's out there to, to help monitor and, and adjust those things uh, like gain or stuff like Zoom has stuff built in, uh, but my brain is forgetting Audacity. Um, that's the, the audio stuff we use, which is free, um, but has a lot of great control and uh, ability to, uh, to change your recording and make it better. So there's a lot of resources out there. We'll probably link some uh, down, uh, down below and stuff, but yeah. Did I spell Logitech C920 correct? Is that what I heard? Okay. Uh, yep. Cool, perfect. Uh, I spelled audio wrong. You guys are subject to all my spelling errors. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I also started on a blue snowball and then upgraded to a blue Yeti um, and then uh, we, we upgraded our GM's microphone to, um, to this uh, Audio-Technica, I think AT2020 with an audio interface. Um, and I think that is the fanciest microphone that we have <laughs> collectively as a group. Um, but I think I just wanna add on that in addition to um, starting with like the bare minimum of tech that's going to work, I think the number one thing that can like vastly improve your uh, your production quality, particularly for podcasting, is um, don't neglect the soundproofing in in your room, um, and you don't you don't need anything fancy. Literally, you just you could build a blanket fort around yourself, like stack some stack some chairs and like throw a comforter over it to uh, to absorb those echoes and dampen the sound, um, and that goes a long way. Um, I think 
uh, what else? Um, oh, and also Kiana mentioned Audacity. Um, Audacity is a free um, open source software that uh, works on multiple platforms. And I would recommend that if you are recording a podcast remotely, um, have everybody on the cast um, download Audacity onto their computer and have them record their audio directly onto their computer um, because that is almost always going to sound better than um, recording like a, a call over the internet, whether you're, you're meeting on Zoom or Discord. Um, we, our, our team's workflow is that we have everybody record onto Audacity on their computer as the primary audio file, um, but then we also jump onto Discord. Um, and we also use, uh, we use this other sort of like online podcasting chat software called Zencaster. Um, to, and that will record the entire call, but we, we used to use that as a primary audio, but they, it would inevitably glitch and, you know, it would make the sound garbled. Um, and so now we use that as a backup, but Audacity as the primary online call recording as the backup hasn't really failed us since we switched to do, doing that workflow. Yeah. For, for podcasting. So for like stream, it's just like whatever's coming through zoom, right? You can capture the audio. It's totally fine. Not a big deal for, for podcasting recording remotely and having everybody record um, to their own computer is like, it's almost, it's like a must in my opinion. Um, but ha knowing that you're going to need backup sometimes. Right. Um, so literally over here being just anal about everything. It's like, I'm recording on zoom individual files so that I can get everybody's audio separately. We're all recording and then doing something like Zencaster. Zencaster is great because you can just record everybody's audio um, and then download it after. Um, but yeah, definitely having backups. Um, and I would recommend listening to everybody's audio ahead of time um, so you can make adjustments. So have everybody record like a sample um, recording, both just them talking, but also with background noise. So like um, something that I have my podcasters do is I have them watch a video at the same time that they're recording. So you can tell how much noise bleed they're coming is coming through their headphones into their microphone, right? Um, so that's gonna make um, that's gonna make a huge difference for your editor. I didn't start doing that till I started editing podcasts. Then I was like, wow, holy! Like, there's I, there's so much like echo coming through this person's headphones um, that makes life as an editor just like nearly impossible. Super frustrating. So um, yeah, there are definitely resources out there um, for for ways that you can really do the most, um, but uh, just like prep and setting up and really like digging into everybody, uh, digging in with everybody about like what they're using and how to get the best results. Cause you can have a cheap mic and still have good results. Um, another thing that for the soundproofing that my husband did was stretched towels. Like he went to Goodwill and bought like 50, like just these like old towels that they were basically just throwing away and stretched them over canvases, right? Um, to to try and like soundproof the room. Um, and it ended up helping a lot. So yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do on a budget to, to get the best kind of setup possible. This might make some of you cringe, but uh, for some of my like very early podcast things, I took my entire computer and my little itty bitty Samson Meteor microphone and I got into my mom's car because the editor was like, oh, you don't have a booth? Well, you know what? Cars are great dead spaces. So I took me, my computer, my mic and a bunch of blankets into my mom's car, parked it close enough to the house that I could get the Wi-Fi <laughs> and I recorded there. Um, and I didn't even use Audacity at that point. Like I recorded literally just to the voice memo app on my computer, but it ended up being being okay enough because the car was good enough dead space apparently That's and amazing. it was fine <laughs> but That's that is so like funny. bare minimum <laughs> yeah I love that that's great I can definitely say you're not alone in that because that's kind of how I got started too it's good stuff <laughs> I will say because I I think y'all covered everything pretty well um, but if you end up recording your podcast or your stream in person, which is a little less common in the mid to panini times, uh, but um, if you're going to be doing it in person, one particular piece of equipment you might, or you'll eventually need to invest in is a mixer. Because if you are recording everything in the same room, uh, that audio can get a little bit mixed up. And if you're trying to get all of those audio files done to the same computer, 
a mixer is going to combine them in such a way that it is workable, especially in the editing process. It's a small thing, but if that is the path you choose to go with it, then it's definitely something you'll want to consider. They can be a little bit pricey, but there are definitely some that are under a hundred dollars and that those will definitely get you where you need to be. And don't forget to check out used equipment too. I started because I got a hand-me-down. So I'm still using a Behringer 1204 USB that was given to me by somebody who wanted a podcast, ended up not liking it. And they're like, I don't have a use for this anymore. Do you want it? And I was like, I'm starting to. So yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> and I still use it. The free thing stuff. Is old. <laughs> I like free stuff. It's free stuff great. Is great. Yeah. Like, I mean, Guitar Center has a bunch of used stuff, Craigslist, you know, Facebook market, um, offer up. There are tons of people take better care of their sound equipment than they do like anything else because it's a very precious and delicate piece of equipment and then I also just wanted to add one more little thing if you really want to go bare minimum for podcasting not necessarily streaming do not discredit the audio capabilities of your cell phone wear headphones go into your closet and set it down in front of you. The, the audio recording on the, especially like newer iPhones and galaxies, like they are top notch. Use it. Yes. Use it. It's there. If that's what you have, I used to actually go to conventions and just straight up use my phone because it, it would block out the sound. I mean, like these things are powerful. These are little computers. You can use it. And most of us already have one. Good Take stuff. I forgot about that. That that actually was my bare, bare, bare minimum was sitting in a blanket fort that I constructed with my phone. I completely forgot about that. That's where yep. I started <laughs> <laughs> podcast auditions from my phone. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you, we, we talked about free things. This is the great segue. Let's talk about money. <laughs> um, uh, I know Noam, you mentioned, uh, paid opportunities. Um, but there's obviously paying people is great, especially if your show is earning money. Um, how, how do money, how, how do you raise money? If you have no money, how do you raise money for a show? Um, let's talk. Let's talk money. Yeah. Um, so, so that was something that was very important to me early on uh, when I first started. Cause I, again, I started streaming before I started podcasting. Um, I realized that there was an opportunity to have some sort of income. And what do you do with that income? Well, there's lots of things you could do with the income besides paying your bills. And don't forget to put like 30% away for your taxes. Cause that's, taxable income if you make over six hundred dollars you have to pay taxes good to know (laughs) and quarterly because it's freelance money just (laughs) fun fact don't don't mess that up don't mess with the irs um but yeah it's it's possible to make money and it is just as possible to compensate the people that are helping you out and it doesn't mean like you know you you can't start until you have like eight thousand dollars to like magically that's that's not the majority of us that do this don't make that kind of money it's just it's not realistic um especially when you're starting off but the, the but for me there are three ways that you can make money in order to finance your production the first way is reach out to sponsors. Reach out to reach out to the people who are publishing the game or who have some sort of you know leg in assisting building up the podcasting community around their game because what it is to the publishers is marketing. You are a marketing tool. Period. Let that benefit you. Get paid to do it. Um, Reach out to the publishers um, through, and I'm going to stress this, the proper communication channels. 
Do not go to their private Twitters. Do not find some backdoor email. Most companies will have some communications person or a press person or a media person or a sponsorship person. Go to their website or their social media. It will direct you to where you can go to request a sponsorship. And the, the next um, one, which is a little more rare, but it's not impossible. And there's a lot of free money out there. Local grants. You can apply for all sorts of grants. There are people out there who have money that are, j it's just waiting for you to apply for it, um, especially in the arts and especially local communities. They want to see their local community elevated and be successful because it usually brings in, you know, it helps build the community. Um, don't be afraid to apply for grants. You'll need to have a, a, a plan, uh, a plan of action, what you're going to be doing with the money, how you're going to be spending the money. There's a lot that goes into grant applications. It's not nearly as easy as it is to just kind of shoot your shot for a, a like a publisher. Um, but the money's out there. I mean, you like thousands of dollars are there. They're available and you could access them and create a production. And then the third way, uh, which I've also found success with is crowdfunding. That's, that's probably one of, one of the easiest ways. Um, a lot of publishers are small, especially if they're indie publishers, they may not have, you know, the money that you're looking for that you were kind of hoping for. Um, but crowdfund, you know, if, if that means, you know, mom and dad are going to throw in 50 bucks, that's $50 you now have in a budget that you can compensate people for. And when I say compensate, it, it doesn't have to be like a minimum wage. It doesn't have to be a bajillion thousand dollars every episode. If you have a budget, be upfront with what that budget is and the expectation of what all participants are going to earn for their participation. It can be you have $100 and that's your budget that's still a paid production. It could be you have $1,000. That is also a paid production. So that's the, the, those for me are the three ways that I've been successful in, um, in finding money to help fund uh, all my productions. All my productions now are paid productions. Thank you for this crash course on how to make money. I don't know if you're following along with <laughs> my screen share, but I've been typing this <laughs> it's out. It's beautiful. They did oh, great. Oh, thank you. That. Thank you. Um, I typed at the bottom, like Patreon, GoFundMe, like how do you, how do you recommend crowdfunding? So, um, so our show has a Patreon um, and I can just sort of talk a little bit about our experience with it. Um, I would say like the first year that we had the Patreon, we had like pretty slow growth in terms of people signing on and supporting us with uh, monthly donations. Um, and then what we learned was that you can't be shy about asking people for money. If people don't know um, that you're asking for money, then they're not going to give it to you. And so I, I think it was toward the end of last year that we decided, you know what, we're going to do a push on Patreon. We're going to try to double the monthly income that we're getting from Patreon. And the way that we ended up doing that was, um, I think the key to success for something like that is to have is to A, have an end goal in mind and B, have a reason for that goal and to publicize that. So in, in our instance, we decided that we wanted to start bringing in more money on Patreon so that we could then use that money to support more independent artists by commissioning art for the show. And so we basically put together that pitch and we went to our community of listeners with that. Um, and we, um, we put together special rewards specifically for hitting that goal that would like stickers that would get sent out to Patreon patrons uh, who signed up during that promotional period. Um, and we ran it for a couple of months and to our complete surprise, it worked. <laughs> so um, that, that's sort of a little bit of a takeaway from our experience. I think that plays into like the social media engagement as well. Like you can have like this great show, but if you aren't telling people about it and you aren't advertising it, no one's going to listen or watch, um, which we will get into social media real soon. But um, 
I think like we covered like fundraising uh, for sponsorships in general, like feel free to hop in here. But like from my understanding of it, as someone who has been on sponsored shows and whatnot, essentially they give you money and you do an ad read for them or you may might do giveaways uh, during your show uh, during the break or whatever. Um, and the sponsor will get like marketing in return, they'll give you money. Um, they're basically paying for an advertisement on your show. Um, reaching out to the actual publishers of whatever game you're playing um, is a great, a great thing. <laughs> um, but like, you can also get like random companies to sponsor you. Like I was, I was on a Star Trek show. This was my very first like sponsored show. We were sponsored on this Star Trek show by Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes way. And it was, and so it was Adam and Eve and uh, Star Trek Fleet Command Mobile, which that one makes sense because we're playing Star Trek. But Adam and Eve sponsored okay, okay. us. I'm just gonna note that and send them a message later. No, literally, like they they were into us because we were a diverse group. Um, this was like an all queer cast playing Star Trek Adventures, and they really liked that we were diverse. We had a large number of POC in our cast, and for some reason, they thought, yeah, people who like Star Trek would also be interested in adult products. <laughs> but they gave us a discount code, so we we would promote their discount code and you could get uh, I think it was like 15% off with our code uh, and that's how that sponsorship worked <laughs> yeah yeah so um uh Salt Free Games uh is is uh partnered with uh Roll20 and with Dice Envy and Grind and Coffee Co um and those all came out um a, a variety of different ways one with Roll20 was because um we kind of had a we were always talking about how we use Roll20 in our shows. Uh, we made our overlays for live streams. We made our overlays pretty prominent to show the, the Roll20, uh, you know, screens and stuff like that. Um, so that, uh, you know, we were able to show off uh, their, you know, their product basically live. So uh, we were able to do that. Um, we've also, um, yeah, there's, so there's with um, Dice Envy and Granny Coffee Co. That was a lot came from after we had already kind of gone in and, and, become kind of established and we we're able to go all right you know let's let's go look for for some companies uh that might be interested in sponsoring and um i think writing coffee co reached out to us um after we we saw that they put out a tweet being like hey are you someone who does streams and stuff are you poc and i was like yes i am hello uh and so that's kind of the tie back and don't be afraid to ask people for money don't be afraid to again in official channels uh, go with in two companies and be like, hello, I see that you are looking for people. Uh, don't select, don't self-select out unless you are not the audience they're looking for, which will be pretty clear. Like unless they're asking for, for POC and you're, and you're white, or if they're asking for queer people and you are not, um, like other than that, don't self-select out of these types of things. If they're just asking for, for, you know, trying to gather a list of potential people to look into, um, I find it super important that when you're going to reach out to a potential sponsors, like doing direct conversations with them, is to have a very well thought out pitch document, uh, pulling together what your va what value you bring in as a sponsored, uh, as a sponsored uh, stream or show or podcast. Um, so, for example, look, pulling at numbers. So, like, hey, we get we have this many followers, we have this many views. Um, or looking at like like the makeup of your, of your group, like hey, like we're a group of you know all queer uh, POC. Um, you know, this is an audience that you might want to be looking into, um, and just and or or be able to go okay. So like, I see that all of you have been have been doing this, and you have this new product coming out. Um, actually, with Magpie Games, we did this recently um, in the in January, uh, December, where they were putting out a new Bluebeard's Bride uh, product, and we're like, we love Bluebeard's Bride. We've done so many shows of with Bluebeard's Bride. Um, could we promote this? And they're like, yes. And we we gave them the numbers, and we gave them, you know, what our prices would be for it. And they're like, sure, here you go. Uh, and we just pulled out. It, like uh, like you were saying, like we pulled out a, an ad read. Um, we made a little trailer. Uh, we had, if you're using stream, use 
CloudBot or whatever else to do reminders of, of codes or anything else like that because often they're tracking clicks, um, how many, how many, uh, how much traffic is going through uh, from your stream or your code uh, to them so that they can see how successful your your sponsorship is. So yeah, so uphold your own end of what of what is theory. Like it's it's pretty easy to think to just half-ass it. Don't do that uh, because you want to maintain professional relationships. Uh, with these companies uh, and take it seriously. Um, so no, you don't have to be like product placement everywhere. Like you don't need to do that, but you do need to take it seriously and go like, okay, how can we actually showcase that we are being sponsored to them? How do we actually shout them out? Um, how do we continue to drive people to to check out our sponsors links and, and make sure that, you know, we're pulling in our share of the deal as well. All good tips. Um, if anyone else has anything else to add, otherwise, I'd like to move on to advertising. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got a great show. We've got a great cast. We have money to pay the people who are working on this show. Um, how do we get it out there? <laughs> um what, what do you recommend for advertising? Like either like social media campaigns, you could literally post up flyers in your hometown. Um, like how do you find your audience? Uh, I, I definitely think there are a lot of different ways you can do this um, and all of them are good. So do all of them, do everything, every way that you think you could possibly tell people about your show, do that thing. Um, obviously, if you're working with sponsors, they'll probably help you with a lot of that. They'll use their own social media to help promote your show. Um, but uh, you can do everything from paying for ad spaces to, um, you know, just promoting it, putting it on blast, getting all of your friends involved. I know that um, <laughs> what, my mother, for like missing any Lee, she was telling literally everyone about it. Um, and that woman can talk. So I feel like so many people <laughs> were listening who had never heard a table top show in their life <laughs> that we're listening to missing Annie Lee. Um, but literally just do everything at your disposal. Um, obviously most of us have some kind of social media, you know, whether that's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube channel, Twitch. Um, and, uh, it's, it's hard to brag on yourself. Sometimes it's hard to be like, Hey, this is a cool thing that I made. Um, but, uh, if you don't, try, you're not going to get the word out there. Um, so I know that for off the table, we primarily do, um, we primarily use Twitter for pretty much everything. That's how we, that's how we cast. That's how we, um, that's how we promote our content. Um, you know, that's pretty much where like everything is located. Um, but when Missing Annie Lee launched, um, we are, uh, all of the off the table podcasts are hosted on Spreaker. Um, and they had this, um, this basically this new thing where you could pay for advertising spaces. So, or for pay for like an ad at the beginning of other people's podcasts. So when Missing Annie Lee started, um, you know, uh, we just budgeted aside some money so that we could have um, our ad for that show uh, play on other people's podcasts who had like similar tastes. And I think that that was definitely worth it for us. We definitely saw an uptick in people who were coming and, and listening to the podcast. Um, so if you can invest funds, go for it. Um, but it's not necessary to get the word out, right? Um, you just have to, you have to be willing to brag on yourself. You have to be willing to, to talk about yourself and your project. Um, but yeah, if you're already working with sponsors, talk to them too. See if they have any ideas. Say, hey, we really would love your help if you could cross promote with us. Like we're, if you're working with a sponsor, like we're promoting you, you could do the same for us. Um, it's mutually beneficial, right? If, if more people are listening to your show where you're promoting their product, then those people listening to their, you know, it's just going to like feed back into them. So um, there's no reason that they shouldn't want to help you, uh, especially, especially with launch. Um, and um giving yourself appropriate time, um, making sure that you're hyping up whatever the project is before it actually goes live, get people anticipating. You can drop uh, teasers. You can drop, I know that people will do like little trailers for uh, shows that are coming out, um, you know, release music, release clips, um, and then staying on top of uh, advertising and promotion um, when you're actually releasing. Um, a lot of people drop off pretty severely after launch, um, but continuing to push and continuing to say like, this is our cool thing that's still happening. Um, you know, just kind of stay on the forefront of everybody's mind. I mean, it's 
it's hard, but you know, you know, social media is a place where you just scroll past it and it leaves your brain forever. So like making sure that you're constantly like present and in the eye of the people that you're trying to reach, um, are all great ways, but yeah, just anything you can think of, anything you can think of, it's worth doing seriously. Another form of advertising that is free, but is also, uh, quite a time commitment is basically becoming a part of the community. Um, becoming a part of the TTRPG community on in social media spaces, spaces such as Twitter um, allows you to network with other shows um, that are in the space. And, you know, ultimately you will make friends um, with other creators that um, may be doing things that are similar to you and have an audience that would also be interested in what you're doing. And so um, with podcasts, something that is often done is promo swaps. Um, so you cut together like a approximately one minute promo of your show um, and you share it with other podcasts um, and then they share their promo with yours and you can put it in you know, the, the pre-roll, mid-roll or end roll um, at the beginning, middle or end of your episode. And for us, this has been a really good method of reaching out to new audiences and in particularly like targeted outreach to people who already are fans of shows um, like yours and are probably on the lookout for more content. Those are all great, uh, great tips. I like the letting your mom brag to people about your stuff because that's great. Also, like your friends will brag about you too, especially like if they're like super invested in what you're doing, like they'll, they'll definitely help with that. Um, your cast can also help promote the show. Um, you can have them talk about like their characters. You could do like, I don't actually know if anyone's actually done this, but uh, you could get like, if you have like character art made, you could have like each cast member at scheduled, like maybe once a week, each cast member will get to, you know, talk about their character in like a one minute, whatever, or something you can introduce the characters that way. And that's all like, I think like Summer was saying like that, that anticipation, you want to start promoting way before your thing comes out because you're, you're going to want people to know about it before it comes out. Um, because then otherwise I feel like it just feels like you're trying to like catch up, like get people, you know, like, oh, look, I made a thing versus, oh, we're going to make a thing, get excited. Here's why you should be excited. Here's what it's about. Here are all the cool people that are working on this thing. Come get excited for us. Follow our Twitter. If you like make a Twitter account for your show, I think that's worth doing at least, uh, for, um, like bigger projects, ones that last for a long time. It's worth having like a separate Twitter for that because then, you can tweet like, for example, for an actual play show, you can be like, oh, we're going live now. And then anyone who's following that account can see that specifically. And then they're not like, quote unquote, like bogged down with like all the other announcements for X, Y, Z, other projects or your own personal stuff. Is that something you'd recommend? Like I, I've seen a lot of shows, like they have their own Twitter. I know that for off the table, we have just like our one main Twitter that where we promote everything, but that's because we're changing shows every four months, right? So like making yeah. um, limited, if you're doing a limited run show, I don't know that you need to dedicate a whole, like a whole social media account to it. Right. Um, but if you're, if you're doing a project, like a podcast, that's going to be lasting a year or two years. I think it's worth it. I mean, a Twitter account is free, you know? Um, also, I would recommend getting an email. You'll probably have to do that if you're setting up a Twitter anyway, but might as well get an email for your podcast as well. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for podcasting, you know, it can, it can really, if your, if your goal is to like, you eventually want to have some kind of like ad revenue or you want to generate income somehow with your podcast, obviously numbers are a huge part of that. But for a, like a TTRPG, like live stream, you really want to generate interest ahead of time. Um, because as much as we don't like to admit it, having a good turnout can make or break a first episode and it can really set the tone for the cast. A cast with an active chat will get so much more hype. Um, and it, the last thing you want is to feel disappointed, like nobody turned out to your show, right? Um, so definitely collaborating with other channels. If you're going to be streaming on your own channel, say like, if you, especially if you have like friends, like I know for off the table, if people are, are like, hey, we're about to have a, we're about to do this new thing. Do you care to host us? I'm like, absolutely. We'd love to, right? Um, and do that same kind of cross promotion, um, especially on nights, like when we're not streaming, I'm like, 
I don't care. I would love to promote other people who are like coming up in the space. Right. Um, so yeah, you really want that. You really want that anticipation so that your first episode, especially your first episode can kind of set the tone for the cast, like reception. I know that for missing any Lee, anytime we get a review, we freak out. We're like, like seriously, so excited. Um, so making sure that people, um, especially people who are close to you and your friends and family and stuff, um, are going to help hype you up is like, it can, it can really set the tone and make you feel really good about this thing that you've promote, like you've produced. Right. Cause ultimately you're making it for an audience. And so having your audience there <laughs> feels really good. <laughs> you're like, yay, people turned out to this thing that I made. For if sure. they don't know about it, they can't do that. Yeah. Exactly. And I think this goes back to like, just like the panel title in general, like you're playing for the public. Like that is the big main difference between uh, producing this show for an audience other than the people who are playing and then just playing at your house. And sometimes like you might like watch this entire panel and think, well, you know, I don't know. And, and, and maybe you just want to stick to the home game and that's completely okay. Like, obviously this isn't for everyone. <laughs> and I think uh, these panelists have, have given such great information about uh, the kind of work that's definitely going into it. Um, I like to spend the last bit of time just on like random miscellaneous things. Something that I know we haven't really talked about is art. Um, and this goes into stuff like branding and, uh, overlays, um, and other sort of like character portraits, etc. Um, how, how, um, for lack of a better term, valuable, because as an artist, I feel like art is valuable, <laughs> but like how, how necessary, I guess, is it having like professionally made art or whatever? Artwork. Do you Ah. <laughs> oh yeah, anyone can talk. I'm I'm done talking. <laughs> I mean, I think art is awesome and hugely valuable. Um particularly um on social media where um audio especially is very easily overlooked like, you know, when you're scrolling through Twitter or or Instagram. Um uh, and, and video to some degree as well because it's muted but art is like it's just there you know it's eye-catching and it like at a glance like visually it tells a story about the character or about the show or if it's like a, if it's a, a banner or a logo it conveys the mood um, of uh, your of your content and and I think art is huge and and absolutely important yeah, I would agree. I think branding is a, it's a huge thing. Um, I think uh, obviously not everybody has like the the finances to go out and find a graphic designer or somebody who can work with you. But if you can't afford it, I would highly recommend it. If you brand yourself properly straight from the get go, you're set up for success. Um, it is so much harder to rebrand later. Um, and the thing is, like people can get turned off from something that doesn't look visibly appealing. Like like if you've taken the time to get the mic, the cam, to get the group together, why not just put in that extra effort to make sure that your stream setup looks good, that your cover art looks good. Um, and it's okay to not be an expert in all of those things. I know that a lot of us are graphic designers because we, we just, we just are just a we lot of the community. Just, we just are, we had to be. Yeah. Um, and a lot of us are, you know, are artistics and, and so many other ways than other just creating like tabletop role-play content. Um, but if you're not, there's no shame in that. Just work with someone who is, that's what I would really recommend. Um, you know, I see so many shows that have amazing potential that just don't get the turnout because they don't look as good as they are. Does that make sense? Um, so For yeah, sure. art is invaluable. Like art is amazing. I know that every opportunity, every time I have the budget to get art, I'm getting art. Um, I think it's, it's an awesome gift for your players if you can't afford it. Like it's, it's just amazing to say like, thank you for doing this thing with me. Um, but also sharing that with an audience and they can just be like, oh, I want to know more about these characters, right? Just from like this, this, like this simple snapshot of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I think that artwork is just, it's just great. Work with people who know what they're doing, except that you can't do everything. I hate accepting that I can't do everything, but, um, working <laughs> with people who can summer. <laughs> literally me just like, can I do it all myself? The answer is no, but I will <laughs> find people who are trained to do these things. And there are so many incredible artists. Like you have no excuse in the tabletop role play space. Like 
so many amazing designers, Hello. so many amazing artists, so <laughs> music too. Like yes. uh, working with a working with a composer, i it blew my mind. I was like, this is the this is the best thing to happen to me is just working with someone who's like super talented and paying them for their time. So if you can do that, if you when you're budgeting, if you're budgeting for this production that you're doing budget for artwork and music like if you can just do it because it's so good it's so worth it um yeah get it if you can speaking as someone who's on like the side of the person who's being hired to make art and um, i've been hired to do like character portraits for various shows i recently worked with uh, rk wild uh, at russ wildest i think is their twitter handle um on doing branding for their brand new all queer trans POC horror anthology podcast. Yeah. Uh, that was my very first graphic design commission, but I'm very proud of what it what it turned out to be. And personally, I mean, I'm definitely biased, but I think it looks real cool. And um, it was such a great uh, uh, experience to not only like work with a client to like bring their vision to life, but also see how happy they were uh, with the finished result. And um, this goes for like the players that I've made player uh, character art for, like seeing a cast reaction to it. It just, it, I think it really helps like solidify and gel a group and th they're always happy to get art of their characters. <laughs> so I, I mean like definitely biased cause I am an artist, but it's great. Hire artists, they'll make great art for you. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> If I can build on that as yes, someone who's been more of a player than a producer for the most part. Uh, yes, art is so good. It's so, especially for podcasts, which are like an audio only medium, having these visual elements to tie you as a player and cast member and eventually your audience to the things that you're doing, the scenes you've set, the, the people that they're following and getting invested in, it really helps just to mirror everything people have said, especially for people who have difficulty visualizing things on their own, giving them like constant, like set in stone images can really help make the experience more immersive. This like portraits, Portraits, for the most part, are less immediately significant for like for streams, but like the as Summer mentioned, the 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 work you put into the overlay and just everything that goes into drawing people in to the story you're trying to tell is so important. And it's understandable if it's something you can't budget for at first, but it's something you're going to want much sooner than later yeah if you if you think about if you consider your time on social media right which is our generation and future generations main way of communicating at this point right we we don't use newspapers we don't typically put stuff up in a starbucks you know pin board anymore um it, it's it's social media because it's free right it's super easy and everybody's on it think about how often you scroll through your feeds whether it's reddit twitter facebook tiktok you see a lot of stuff and the best value that art gives when done right when done thoughtfully you end up interrupting people's feeds in the best of ways. And that's what that that's your main goal with artwork, with branding. That that is advertising. That goes back to, to what we had previously talked about. That's a form of marketing. Um, you want people, they they will give you hardly a second of their time flipping through whatever. You have half a second to make a statement and make an impression before they go to something else. So whether you can afford to, to hire somebody out for art, and if you can't, there's a lot of really good free resources. I know a lot of people use like GIMP, Canva. Um, there's tons of free assets. Um, 
Pexels is a really great place. Pixabay is a great place if you just need like beautiful images that are for that are public domain or free use. The Can you Smithsonian that Pixa something. Uh, Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. Pixabay, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the Smithsonian like just released like hundreds and thousands of works for public domain use, which means you can use it for whatever reason. Also, do yourself a favor and make sure you read up on copyright laws. <laughs> Please do that. We talked about taxes. Also have to understand copyright laws. IP is a thing. Do not steal Just things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you could be sued so hard, so fast, and for a crap ton of money. Doesn't matter if you're brand new to the industry or a veteran copyright law learn it before uh, you even copyright law <laughs> that's that's something to do step one read on copyright law yes <laughs> the 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 skinny though is basically don't use stuff that you don't want permission to use and if you're not sure if you have permission to use it definitely look it up or ask stuff that's in the public domain is is generally good uh, good to use this even goes for fonts. This is something that a lot of people like don't know, but like a lot of fonts are labeled for personal use only. So you have to make sure that your font is in the public domain or is 100% free. Uh, you can go on to, uh, I, I use da font, that's like D-A-F-O-N-T, da font.com to find fonts. And you can um, put in the uh, search filters for fonts that are only like public domain or 100% free because those are the ones you can use. If something is free for personal use, you're gonna have to pay commercial license if you're gonna use that font for your advertising, branding, et cetera, um, assuming your show is there to make money. Uh, that, that is not personal use. If you are getting money, that is not personal use. <laughs> uh, one more, uh, one quick add-on just under the broader umbrella of branding and marketing is um, I would recommend consider having a website uh, for your show um, it, it's like one landing page where you can put all that amazing art uh, and showcase your episodes. Uh, you can have recaps and summaries. You could host your transcripts there. And it can just be a one-stop shop for people to know where to find you, where to watch and listen to you. Um, you know, if you don't have the resources or time to make a website, you can at the very least put together a link tree page, um, which is like, it, it's... Uh, it's like a, a site where you can just like drop all of um, the relevant social media handles, um, your, your Twitch page, your pod, like all the different podcasting platforms that you can be found on. Um, you just want to make it as easy as possible for people to find you and learn more about you. Yeah, that's that good SEO stuff. Yes. Going make off that of website. Yes. Just do, whether you use it or not, just do it. You want to be searchable. Do it. Good stuff. Yes. Linktree. I also put a uh, card.co. Uh, card, it, it's spelled with two R's, is a basically a single page website. They'll host it for free. There's like a paid version that you can get like extra cool stuff or whatever, but like it's at the very least, like you're going to want a place where you can like people can see like about you. What is the show about links to like where you can watch, uh, watch or listen? Is it Spotify? Is it a Twitch, etc.? Like card.co allows you to just create like a very basic website that you can put your information on. You can also attach social links to it. I put Squarespace, Wix, et cetera, for like all of these tools, uh, other website builder things. Uh, yeah, we were sponsored by Squarespace. No, <laughs> like <laughs> um, there, there's a lot of like free website builders out there um, that you can use to um, make, make sites. And uh, it's free. Uh, a lot of them have like free options. I know you can pay to like get your domain name or, or get uh, like extra cool layouts or whatever. Um, and then like on the other end of things, you could hire somebody to make a website for you. <laughs> um, but obviously that that's not necessary. I, I like, there's so many ways you can do it for free. I wouldn't recommend doing that unless your show is like real big. <laughs> um, yes, website's good. Good place to consolidate information for sure. Um, 
I do want to say uh, we have reached uh, one hour and 30 minutes. Um, I would like to open it up if uh, any of the two people here have any questions. Uh, if, if you feel like asking questions, you can unmute or whatnot. Um, while you, if you want some time to think, uh, we did get a couple or one audience question that was asked beforehand. Um, and this person wanted to remain anonymous, but they just wanted to know, like, why do you like playing publicly? Like, how did you get into this? And like, why do you like doing what you do? Um, yeah, I, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Why do you like playing publicly? I think ultimately for me, it's about sharing something that I care deeply about with other people. Um, we all know how, how hype it feels to share something you like to share a hobby with others um and to or to tell a friend about this thing that you really care about and to have them be super into it and support you too um and i think ultimately it's like there is something so wonderful about a home game and about sharing that experience just with those people at the table right um but for me it's kind of a way to do that but a little bit bigger um you you have these characters and these stories and kind of like you're like cementing them into the world right like it goes out onto the internet and it's going to be there forever and it's just it's like this this thing that you get to create with your friends or with these people that you know you collaboratively tell something tell the story um and you get to share it with other people and it just gets to go out there and be in the world and that is such a cool thing um you know it's wild to think like you know, these projects that we're starting now and we're pouring like our heart and souls into, like people could be listening to that, finding it a year, two years or 10 years from now, you know? Um, and it's it's something that you get to share with people as you go throughout your life um, and, or go back and revisit it yourself. Like, um, you know, campaigns that I've been done with for a year or two years, I can go back and see those and I can see how much I've grown as a, as a producer and a role player. And I think that that's a super, super cool thing. Um, you know, not everybody wants their hobbies out there on the internet. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're not absolutely loving what you're doing, you know, why do it? Um, and so it's just, for me, it's just a true love for, for the hobby um, and a desire to share that with as many people as possible. For me, it's a lot of the same, I would say, but also it is, it's about the sense of community that can come from like sharing these stories and like telling these stories. You, you find people who have like interests in common or who are drawn to the same like tone or subject matter that you find yourself drawn to as well and it's you would be surprised how many connections can just sort of form and I don't know like part of it's because storytelling is kind of my day job um, but being able to to form a community around like the the shenanigans that you and the people you're doing this with get into I don't know. It, it's not a connection I've really experienced with anything else I've done in my life. And it's not really something I would want to give up. For sure. Uh, for me, I think it's, I mean, literally on top, I think we're all just building on top of each other because yes, I agree, Summer. Yes, I agree, Junie. Um, But I think like uh, another thing to add is representation. Um, yes. As a <laughs> trans man, they're like we're invisible in almost every space imaginable i now use my platform to emphasize trans masculinity um Hell because yeah. it wasn't there when i grew up uh, you know i i want to highlight other trans men i want to see us in those spaces and, and i know that that can be applied to any marginalized identity because when you see yourself doing awesome things or you see like a character that represents a part of you doing amazing things that opens up so many doors whether you're a child a teen an adult 
somebody somewhere is going to look at that character or look at that production or listen to that story and go like, wow, if they're out there doing that, why can't I go do something like that? Yeah, and for sure. Why not? Why, why can't you do it? For sure. Exactly. And I feel that too. Like just, I, I find it so empowering, especially when you're on a show with a bunch of people who all share um, some semblance of your marginalization identities uh, to be with that group, that community, like Junie was saying, is an incredibly powerful experience. And then to be able to share that with large platforms, to have that representation out there, especially like, I, and I, I'm not, I don't know if any of you have actually, if have the, uh, bleh, I don't know if this has been stated yet, but the other thing about this is that anyone can make this. Like there's, there's not, the, I mean, yeah, there's like a little bit of like, a wall but it's not as big as like making a movie like enable like to be able to make a movie i think is a lot harder versus doing an actual play stream making a podcast i feel like it's a lot more accessible and therefore there can be a lot more representation and i think that's really powerful uh, especially for marginalized groups yeah uh, absolutely and um i actually was introduced to tdrbgs by watching a stream uh about oh god like five six years ago now um and i was i was at a point where i was looking for something uh you know that fit into a creative hole in my life and i was like i came in uh from uh a, a creator i liked um and i was just like oh this is really this seems really cool and this seems really fun i i want to be involved now uh, and that's how I threw myself one into the online community. And then uh, within a year, I started playing um, a, a home game by myself and uh, with, you know, with my friends. Uh, and then about six months after that, I, I got into uh, I got into my first streaming appearance. Uh, and so it's just become this whole circular, uh, like uh, coming back to a cycle of, of, uh, I, I, of, you know, having so much enjoyment watching these shows uh, and being part of those communities uh, and just wanting to then also be involved uh, in my own way. Uh, and then obviously with, you know, levels of, part of, of representation and being able to showcase that, um, being able to have fun and, and especially with, you know, where streaming and podcasting is going these days, uh, really experimenting with the types of stories that can be told uh, in this medium that can't be told elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more of uh, simil uh, similarity with uh, like actual play streaming um, with live theater and interactive uh, live yes, theater yes, and, yes, and, yes. <laughs> uh, and especially uh, involving, you know, tech and uh, looking at, you know, also like ARGs and uh, all that stuff. Like there's, a whole world of, of digital performance and storytelling that we're, we're just kind of starting to crack now, uh, which is super fascinating to me on, on several levels as a performer, as an academic, as a, as a creator in general. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just really cool and really fun to play with people. Uh, and then also just to be creating uh, with this really cool tool and space that we have. Very yes. well put. Yes to all of the above. And it's just like an amazing and fun creative outlet. Um, Nala said that, you know, it's, it's like making a movie, but more accessible. Uh, that really um, resonates with me because like making movies was something I always wanted to do. Um, but when I'm editing the podcast and I place some music under some action or dialogue and it hits just right, like that mm. is so satisfying. And it, it, you know, it just scratches that creative itch. Um, and the, the thing about representation as well, you know, we get a chance to tell the kind of story that we wish we got to have when we were growing up. Um, and, yep. and, um, and then sharing that with an entire community of listeners who may also feel the same way. And, you know, hearing feedback uh, from our fans saying like, you know, like this episode really cheered me up. I was having a rough day, but you, you made me laugh. Um, you know, there's nothing better than that. Um, and you, there are other forms of media where that feedback cycle is a lot slower. 
um, you know, traditional publishing, for example, but like with actual plays like streaming and podcasting, you, you do become embedded in that community and you, you get to hear from people a lot sooner and it's just a great feeling. It's, it's incredibly rewarding too, to have this show that you worked your butt off on you can put it out and you can get feedback on it and you get people telling you all like these things like you just said like oh this character the scene this representation has made me really has feel made me feel happy or this this cheered me up oh, or this was so scary and I loved it like <laughs> like I I think that's at least for me like this is this is why I like doing it. it's a love of performing a love of um uh being able to have a fun time with friends and to share uh, with other people. I do a lot of charity streams. So obviously I like playing on those to help raise money for absolutely fantastic causes to raise awareness for things that um, we need to be talking about nowadays. Um, but yeah, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. Um, and it's also just really creative. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, yes. Uh, if there's no further questions, I would like to just wrap up. Does anyone else have any last thoughts? Um, any Anything you'd like to finish out with here? Uh, I know that like everything that we've talked about, it can feel overwhelming, like seeing how much can go into this, but I would just say, go for it. Like if you really, if this is something you wanna try, go for it. Um, there are so many amazing people out there who are more than happy to talk to you about this stuff. I know that like my DMS are open on Twitter. Um, so if you, if you want to, to pursue this, go for it. Don't let, don't let this, the, the fear, you know, kind of prevent you. Cause we all were in that same position at one point or another of not knowing what the heck we were doing, not knowing how to get started. Um, and there are a lot more resources, um, the further or the more popularized that podcasting and, uh, streaming TTRPGs gets, there's, there's more and more people who are, who are available to help you. Um, so yeah, just, just reach out on social media, um, and go for it. Cause it's, it's, it can be a really rewarding experience. For sure. Uh, to add what we're doing right now don't forget that when you start you could be in the same spot too elevate others you're never you're never better than anybody else just remember that elevate others help promote others share the knowledge and information that you have discovered usually you know trial by fire right it's it's a lot of experimentation and seeing what works and what doesn't um share share that knowledge all it's going to do is make the community better and stronger more validated by mainstream um which means more opportunities for for revenue do it. Like just, just help others up, join podcasting communities, share the resources that you find, um, leave reviews for other podcasts that you enjoy, listen to other podcasts, um, until you get to the point where then you have too much production work <laughs> and then you literally can't listen to them anymore. Um, but yeah, don't, don't forget you, you, we all started somewhere you're going to start somewhere once you even take that first step you're already a step ahead of somebody else who's going huh can i do this and you should always say yes yes you can that's a really great like closing note <laughs> i mean i think like this is this has been absolutely fantastic there's so much information out there um, and if any of the panelists have further resources and whatnot, um, I'm going to ask them to send it to me and I will post it. Uh, I'll post it in the uh, discord as well as um, in the club discord, uh, as well as I'll put it in the YouTube uh, description uh, for everyone who will be watching this on YouTube afterwards. Um, but I'd love to close out if we could just go around one more time, uh, tell us where we can find you and uh, plug the really cool stuff you make. 
<laughs> summer, would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've been summer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at just a summer job. That's where I tweet and retweet about everything that I've got going on. Um, the two things that I'd like to promote is uh, I'm a writer for Urban Shadows Second Edition. That's uh, already been completely funded, but it's going to be coming out soon. I'm writing playbooks. I'm doing some uh, writing internally and uh, helping design the city hubs. Uh, so that's been really exciting. I'm super, super excited for those things to come out. You can get the quick start for free right now. Um, so just go look up Urban Shadows Second Edition. You can find it online. Um, and the other thing is Missing Annie Lee. It's the podcast that Off the Table is co-producing with Salty Sweet Games. Um, and it, it comes out every Friday. We only have five episodes left. Um, and it has been it has been such a pleasure to work on that show and um, toot toot, it's really good. So uh, <laughs> please go listen to it if you haven't, um, because if you like if you like horror, um, you'll love this. Uh, please, please give it a listen. Tell us what you think. Hell yeah. Juni, where can we find you? You can find me mostly on Twitter at Stellar Empress, uh, where you'll hear about most of the projects I'm doing. Um, for the most part, uh, my work is done with Off the Table. I'm one of three co-producers alongside Summer and Katie, who is not here right now. Um, we have a lot of exciting things in the works for this summer and this fall. I can't talk about all of them yet, but I think you'll love them. Um, specifically, I would like to plug, on top of Missing Annie Lee, of Black Glass, uh, the podcast that I am in. Uh, Leanne, you've mentioned that you enjoyed it, and that made my day, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but honestly, it was such a blast to tell that story with these folks. They're all fantastic. The character work is wonderful. The The audio is amazing. So thank our editor for that. Uh, outside of that, for my day job, I'm a sensitivity reader with uh, writing diversely. If you are a writer and you are interested in like giving, what's the phrase? Giving your stories that that extra shine. Writing diversely is uh, a place you can go to contact any number of sensitivity readers for any number of topics or issues. And we are happy to help you out. And yeah, I think that's it. Hell yeah, Gnome. Uh, hey, what's up? I'm Gnome. You can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram at Nomedic. Uh, branding, y'all. If you type in Nomedic, I'm everywhere. <laughs> Branding is important. <laughs> if I can impart that, if that's the only Hell thing. Hell yeah. Brand, <laughs> branding is so important. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, the, I'm the communications director for Die Hard Dice. Um, I do live and podcast productions, um, both on my own uh, Twitch channel and on a uh, hundred other places. I love kind of like moving around and just working with a bunch of different uh, creators. Um, I run a talk show, which is kind of like a podcast uh, every morning uh, called Gnome Brew with uh, Eris Zavad and Wally132, where we talk about TTRPGs and life. And then we have uh, we have our friends come on every so often uh, to talk about what cool RPG things they're uh, working on in this space. I think, I think that's kind of it right now. Everything else is either ND8 or, or in... in not quite ready for public consumption. So yeah, thanks um, thanks for having me. This was this is awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And also, uh, I hear you about that NDA life. <laughs> Yay! Uh, Kiana. Yeah, uh, you can find me over on Twitter at Kiana S. Uh, best way to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, I do a lot of TTRPG stuff. Uh, whether that's streaming or writing or uh, self-publishing stuff or just kind of floating around on the internet it's uh there's there's a lot going on in my life uh but if you are specifically looking at uh my streams and podcasts uh go check out salty speed games uh on twitch and twitter um and on youtube basically uh, i handle most of the social media there uh and uh, we go live with some you know weekly ttrpg stuff as well as some video game stuff when we feel up to it uh and put also onto a vod and we've got you know our, our big roll 20 show which is a burn bright campaign that i gm uh, which is coming to its final little bit of the season, which is kind of wild. Uh, so uh, definitely go and check 
that out uh, because that you know, basically if you want to get the full gamut of what a big sponsored stream looks like, that's that's the one. It, it's co produced with full twenty, so uh, that's that's Good where you're stuff. gonna get a lot of Heck the yeah. uh, a lot of the uh, what the end product kind of looks like. And of course, uh, missing Annie Lee um, is is super uh, super great as well. Uh, so yeah. Hell yeah. And last but not least, Leanne. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly on Twitter. You can find me at Leanne Shaw Rose. Um, my show Bad Heroes is also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Bad Heroes Cast uh, and our website, badheroescast.com. Uh, it is a single long running homebrew campaign. Um, it's a sort of like a mix of comedy and light horror, if that's your jam, um, definitely check it out. Um, you know, the, the quality gets better and better over, the, over time with the episodes. Um, absolute labor of love. Um, I love the cast and crew involved with that. Uh, the other project that I'm involved with is I am a fiction editor for Corio Magazine, which is a speculative sci-fi and fantasy magazine that focuses on stories told from uh, an immigrant and diaspora perspective. Uh, we are brand new. Um, our first issue is out now. Um, all the stories are available for free online. Uh, we also have a podcast and our second issue is dropping tomorrow actually. Um, and so that is Choreo spelled K-H-O-R-E-O -E uh, mag.com and also on Twitter at Choreo mag. Thank you so much. That sounds super cool by the way. I didn't know about that. So I will have to check that out. Um, I have been your moderator. I am on Twitter at Nala Wu. Um, and you can find me on every other social media, also including Twitter on uh, at Nala Draws. That's my art stuff. Uh, I am a freelance illustrator. I do stuff in the tabletop game space, as well as my own like personal projects and all that fun stuff, character designs, fantasy illustration, the whole shebang. I am available for freelance work starting this summer. And then once I graduate, in November, uh, I'm so close, so close. <laughs> Once I graduate, I'll be looking for full-time work. Uh, but yeah, come chat with me. I, I'd love to talk to people about uh, this general stuff. Um, I'd love to thank these lovely people for coming to uh, speak to me about this lovely stuff. Um, and I hope to see uh, so many more amazing new podcasts and shows uh, from people in the future, because there's absolutely space for everybody at this table, space for everyone to tell their stories. And you should not be afraid to take the leap and do it. <laughs> uh, but yes, thank you all for coming. Um, and that, that is it. Thank you all.